Hello everyone and welcome to the Pennsylvania Earth Sciences Association with Pisa Presents Arn Petoskey Stones, the life and times of the coral fossil that became Michigan's state rock. So this is very fondly dedicated to all our wonderful followers in Michigan, so thank you for the support and let's start. First of all, our story begins, like many others with geology, with a little bit of plate tectonics, specifically that going on in the Devonian period. So at the time, Michigan was there. And Michigan, you see, was during that period covered by a warm and shallow sea. So for those that may not be aware, the continents are actually moving and changing position over time. And so as millions of years progress, they slightly shift a little bit. So during this time, the Devonian, 358 million years ago, Michigan was relatively close to the equator, which made the climate perfect for coral. And that subsequent tectonic activity gradually moved today's Michigan north to the 45th parallel. So if you kind of look to see up in the kind of the top middle where it says Siberia in the red one, sort of where the Siberia is, that if you can imagine a horizontal line, that would be the 45th parallel. So not only did it move north kind of up on the planet, but it also moved it up in terms of just altitude and above sea level, which really exposed a lot of the material that they had there. Now, this material, this Devonian material, well, overall, rocks outcrop for the Devonian period at less than 3% in the United States for bedrock. But that average is actually pretty high in Michigan. On the left right there, you can see a correlation chart for Devonian rocks in the southern peninsula of Michigan. Now, some of these rocks consist of the Alpena limestone, which consists of limestone with shale, and that correlates to the gravel pit formation, which is part of the rather famous locally traverse group. Now, that itself consists of a few different individual kinds of rock and formations rather, the gravel point formation, of course, the Charlevoix limestone, that word will become very important later, the Petoskey formation, Whiskey Creek, and the Jordan River formation. All of these different bodies of rock are very, very fossiliferous with Devonian period fossils and are the type of things that you would look to see for finding our uh, star subject for today. Now, this is not really two million years ago. This is today's Lake Michigan, which is stunningly beautiful, is it not? But if you can just picture this, so two million years ago, Michigan was subject to a lot of glacial activity. And glaciers, well, yeah, they kind of do that. So now that was a very key thing because glaciers then we worked this Devonian bedrock and transported the fossils within, specifically some of these fossils right there. Now, some of this land around which this happened was around here during the peninsula of Michigan. So to give you an idea of the geography here, so they're a bit northwest of Green Bay and kind of just pretty much right at the tip there. Now, a very, very, very important figure in Michigan history is Bidosige. So he was born in roughly 1787. They're not quite sure. And his name is Ottawa. He was an indigenous Native American. His name means he comes with light or according to some sources, he shines this way. And as the legend goes, he was born and right away the sun's rays just hit his face in a way that in his father's eyes, it was like the son was saluting his child. And so the father then felt that his son deserved this great noble name because he was going to be a great and noble person. And indeed, he actually was. He became a very highly respected chief and local businessman. And he became known as Petosiga or Petosige. Now, because these names weren't exactly kind of standardized really at the time, and there's a lot of variations in certain languages, you may see that spelled with a Y at the end. You may see that hyphenated between each syllable. 
but still, same name, just different variants of spelling that mean all the same guy. So that particular version of his name meant Rays of the Rising Sun, which really, if you think about how his birth name is pronounced, it's not too kind of far off with how languages interact. Now, he was so wealthy towards the end there, well, not really even towards the end. He still had many decades of life left, fortunately. But because he was doing so well, he wanted to give back to his tribe. And he purchased land near today's Bear River, which was that map again, the little dot that says Bear River, in around 1836. Some will tell you roughly 1837. Now, it is on this land that some of these key fossils were first found. He was later known by the anglicized version of his name, which is Petoskey. Now, that particular statue was erected in 2005, and the town of Bear River was renamed for him in 1873. So he's been very well sort of honored for his many accomplishments, in addition to being the namesake of, of course, the Petoskey Stone. So just what is a Petoskey Stone? Yes, it's this famous fossil found on a famous man's land, but really, what physically is it? Well, you may surprise you, or it may not, but either way, it is actually a coral. Specifically, Hexagonaria percarinata. Now, some people may say that some of the bottom three species count as Petoskey stones as well, but that's something that's kind of a little bit back and forth, and most individuals will very much say that it's Hexagonaria specifically, that, that particular species, and it's even officially according to when everything became official with the State Rock in Michigan, which was, if memory serves me, 1965, it was that specific species is listed in the paperwork as Petoskey Stone. So if you're wondering, really only the top one is official. Overall, though, that particular genus, Michigan is home to seven species of their corals. They're also found in several different states as well and overseas. Now, they are the type of coral known as rugose coral. Now, rugose corals can be solitary, which are just kind of by themselves chilling out, or they can be colonial, which is those right there. Those, each individual opening there, and we'll get more into the terms of things in a second, those are individual coral polyps, or at least the remains of the individual coral polyps. Now, while the genus was in only the Devonian, rugose corals were from the Ordovician to the Permian, so that's a pretty sizable chunk of time, which really speaks to how durable and how well established and hardy they were as a group. Now, right there, you can see, and this, by the way, is the exact species of coral that Petoskey stones come from. Now, you can kind of see how it looks like on the side there. And this is another wonderful specimen from Mr. Mark Michaels. I was very blessed to have several people by Mich from Michigan Rockhounds contribute their time and their photos to this. So thank you very much to all of them for that. So that gives you another idea of how much this looks like up close with a very clear lit specimen. Now, some of these terms giving you an idea of what's what in terms of the physics of these specimens. So a coralite is the individual coral, the individual coral of polyp. So you can see on a close-up of a specimen on the right, and then a polished specimen is, of course, in the box on the left. Now, the callus is the top of the coralite. The columellas are the little parts in the center that kind of look darker and somewhat round. And the costae are the kind of the white, some people call them the spokes from the wheel is the analogy, coming out from the middle. So a little anatomy lesson on Petoskey stones. Now, some more information on them. They're tightly packed, often six-sided coralites, usually about a quarter to roughly an inch wide. Now, during fossilization, they're replaced with mostly calcite, which is why they're so popular to polish. It's a very easily workable stone that accepts a polish well. 
but still because it's relatively soft you got to be careful with polishing it also too you can find various clay minerals pyrite and even quartz in there as well now if you happen to have some iron added during the fossilization process that can give you the rare and wondrous pink pet which is literally a pink color petoskey stone now also with these the septa can be very very thin and if you look close they may have crossbars now some tips for finding petoskey stones with the kind assistance of more of our friends from michigan rock hounds thanks again guys so some local regulations to keep in mind one is only allowed to remove 25 pounds of stones per year from state land so you know don't go sneaking in and out of here like a ninja and just carrying out bags of this stuff because i don't want to hear it when you get arrested now if any petoskey weighs over 25 pounds it can be confiscated and recently a stone of a rather sizable heft was found it took the gentleman something about four days to get it out and when it was discovered the existence of said stone that is it was indeed confiscated and is now in housed in a local museum so guess for a second folks i'll give you some time at home figure out how big this recent find was 93 pounds Yes, I do not blame this guy for taking that much time to get out a 93-pound coral fossil from the water because, oy vey, that, that took a lot of work. So, Petoskey stones do not obviously spring out fully polished. They don't always look just nice and neat and tidy. Some of the polishing is indeed, of course, obviously due to wave water a little bit of sand action and also due to the glaciation itself over time now what people do recommend is because things don't come out looking like that all the time look for light and off color cues like look for something that's a little bit gray like a gray brown like rachel mcgee advises she did the photo to the left by the way thank you rachel now look around and if you can see any bigger light gray rocks kind of flip them over see if you can hear see a hint of different shades and also too as heather strickland advises take off your sunglasses because while yes you're by the water still you want the best kind of vision for just the hue of the tone of the colors that you can see now a couple of extra little things coming from some folks that have done it and lovely picture on the left of some people very interestedly hunting away merrily these fossils cannot be found on sand only beaches you need some rock there as well now storms there's a big thing with folks that often they people either swear by like going so many days after a rare a rainstorm to some fossil sites or a lot of people have a system with petoskey stones folks have found that because you're dealing with the great lakes here which are really really friggin big storms can either redeposit or clear away a lot of samples so it can happen either way but rain or moisture does make them easier to spot because it brings out the pattern in them. So if you have a very clear day and it's been dry, like say now it's been so dry lately, bring a squirt bottle. Just bring a little squirt bottle with some water and kind of if you're looking at something from a distance, just give it a little squirt. And if you can kind of see the pattern emerge, then well, you may have found a pet. Also too, because of the melt water, just bringing out more fossils, Early spring is advised as a good time to look, and you may be wondering, are Petoskey stones fluorescent? Well, some are, and some aren't, because there can be such a variety, and I mean, the pyrite and the quartz and the clay minerals were just a sampling of some of the minerals that people have found in there. You gotta keep in mind that because of the different minerals that are found in them, they may or they may not be fluorescent. But what Randy Emmons advises as, if you hunt at night with a 365 nanometer light, they show up brownish gray with black eyes. So some places to find them. Keep in mind that Petoskey State Park, while it's one of the more common ones for people that are new to the hobby to go straight to it, I mean, obviously Petoskey Stone, Petoskey State Park, that's very common sense. 
If you go there, go to the shoreline or Little Traverse Bay, and please keep in mind that you need a permit to obtain samples from there. You can also, too, try Magnus City Park Beach. Or you can do what Nancy Duffney Fader did and found these on dirt roads around the various coastlines in the area, specifically Rogers City Back Road. And I mean, that is a lot of Petoskey stones right there and stunningly beautiful, aren't they folks? I mean, great job, Nancy. Now, this is Jackie Sames with a five pound, nine ounce Petoskey from Rockport. Rockport Park is also another very round, renowned place to find them. And there was also this particular specimen is the baby sibling of a big bouncing 12 pound Petoskey stone as well that was found at the same location a little bit prior. Now you may see the word I mentioned the Charlevoix earlier. Now that is kind of a cousin to the Petoskey stones. Charlevoix stones are favocite corals. There are different kind of coral, but they're often mistaken for Petoskey stones and kind of lumped in there. And indeed, on the left there, that is a public source image. That I got by looking up the phrase Petoskey stone. That's it. And I looked through, and right there, front middle, that is a Char Charlevoix stone. To me, it stands out very obvious, but that's just kind of like how my eyes work. I think that it looks like they have scales. I've seen another few people describe them as having scales, but it's all up to really kind of how your eyes interpret things visually. They have much smaller coralite and the costae are very pale colored and they don't always reach the center. So sometimes it looks like you just kind of have lines like going towards the middle, but they don't always reach there. And there's a couple of noted places to get the Charlevoix stones as well, just in case you were interested in them too. And yes, some of these other places are also well known for finding Petoskey stones as well. Now, polishing your samples. That there in the hand on the left is an unpolished Petoskey stone. So you can kind of see what these people mean by say like bringing a squirt bottle or taking off your sunglasses because visually if you're outside and you're just looking at all of this rock, all of this stone, yeah, I can definitely see, even with good eyesight, that that might be hard to spot. So some very detailed instructions are on the website listed above. They're kind of summed up right there. And these are courtesy the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. So thank you very much, guys. In short, you first smooth the stone with a file to remove any excess bumps. And then you sand with care using increasing grit stone pa uh, sandpaper, ending up with about a 600 grit. You rinse and dry the stone and repeat until all the scratches are gone because you can't get a good polish if your stone still has scratches. And they also recommend a, quote, car finished rubbing compounds for the polishing. So on June the 28th of 1965, our famous local icon got quite a boost. Present is Ella Jane Petoskey, the only living grandchild of the great chief to which these fossils were named after. And on that day, Governor George Romney signed a bill, she actually signed it below as well to put it into record, that made the Petoskey Stone Michigan State Stone. So while it's not a stone and it's a fossil, a coral fossil at that, it is still an absolutely wonderful and remarkable piece of not only Michigan's history, but also glacial geology in the United States as well. So thank you once and always to our wonderful followers in Michigan. Thank you very much to everybody. For those on YouTube, if you like this, please don't forget to give us a like and subscribe and then f uh, visit our Facebook page later. Thank you very much, folks. And until later, we'll see you soon. And